live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to a special edition of Inside Scoop. <laughs> I am your host, Katherine Reed, and today's Inside Scoop is in collaboration with SALT, Social Action Linking Together, an advocacy organization that has been in the Northern Virginia area since 1983, <laughs> under the leadership of John Horsch. Every year, SALT has a legislative agenda where they advocate for good public policy that impacts people in marginalized communities, not just here in Northern Virginia, but all across Virginia. Joining me on today's show are Senator Janet Howe from District 32, Senator Dick Saslaw from District 35, Senator Barbara Favola from District 31, and Senator Adam, Adam Eben from District 30. Thank you all for being here today. <coughs> Catherine. Um, I want to point out that our show today is in advance of the April 3rd veto session of our legislature. For those who may not always follow how legislation is made here in Virginia, we have a part-time legislature, and we either meet for 45 days, in this, in this case 47, or we meet for 60 days. But then there's a veto session where after the governor has looked at all of the bills, he decides what he will veto, what he will sign, and what he will ask for amendments on. Mm -hmm. So that veto session is on April 3rd, and at this time there are several things in play. I want to ask Senator um, Dick Saslaw to talk a little bit about substitutes to association health care plans um, and talk a little bit about uh, the marquee legislation that got pass passed last year for Medicaid expansion that dramatically increased the number of Virginians who are eligible to receive health care. Well, <clears throat> as you know, we tried for four or five years to get Medicaid expansion passed and for a ver one reason or another it, it, it never did. In fact, we couldn't get it out of, uh, essentially out of committees. Um, I think what more or less tipped it was the uh, election of 15 new uh, Democrats yep. to the House of Delegates. Fondly referred which, to as the <coughs> freshman 15. Right. And um, I think that, you know, uh, community and uh, newspapers, news organizations constantly talking about it led to the speaker having a change in heart. And the change came in the House. Uh, not so much in the Senate, That's right. but um, what, um, uh, you know, when they started the program, the government would pay 100 percent of the cost of this expansion. Uh, but then um, the, uh, it, it declined each year by 2 percent till it reached a floor of the government paying 90 percent, and we would pay 10 percent. But uh, uh, what we were able to do, you know, because the opponents to that constantly said, well, when it's fully implemented, it's going to take $250 million out of our budget, which would be true. But uh, the hospitals uh, stood actually to benefit from this because these people are occupying their uh, emergency, emergency rooms. rooms. Mm -hmm. So as a result, um, they decided they would take an uh, what's called an assessment uh, tax, um, and they picked up our 10 percent. So it's not costing us any money at all. Is that what's called the hospital bed tax? Uh, uh, or is that an assessment, really? <coughs> it was an assessment. It's a voluntary assessment. It's a voluntary they assessment, right, which they agreed to, 10 uh, you know, which is going to pick up our 10 percent. So it's not costing the state uh, anything at all. And this... Uh, Right, uh, we estimate that there could be as many as 400,000 people who would benefit. I think to date it's been about 237,000 uh, have signed up. Since January 1st uh, of uh, this year, 2019. January 1st, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's providing health insurance, you know, people who meet the qualifications uh, that probably never had it before or would sit all day in the uh, emergency, emergency room. room. So uh, that. Uh, that was the purpose, you know, I mean, that's what we needed to do. And make no mistake about it, when they show up in the emergency room, we wind up paying for it. Everybody um, does. Everybody does. And, you know, I, I tell people, and you tie it to the minimum wage, 
uh, you know, you may be paying them seven twenty-five an hour, but uh, the government's paying them at least that because we're picking up their health care benefits, we're picking up, uh, you know, the food benefits, uh, you know, through the SNAP program, supplemental right. nutrition. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, this is something that they need to understand: is that it's the fifteen dollars an hour may wind up to save some money, uh, particularly on government budgets. <coughs> so uh, we passed that. Now this year, and you mentioned these association health plans. What a Before Dick goes sure. into that, could I just uh, <coughs> pipe me. up on something that really has impressed me on, on the Medicaid expansion? And that's how smooth the transition has been. We have been able seamlessly to put hundreds of thousands of people onto the rolls for <coughs> Medicaid <coughs> Uh, and to get the providers <coughs> for them in place. Uh, and um, as my office has had no complaints, people are just really pleased it's happened. Uh, and when you compare that to what happened at the federal level initially, and all the computer problems and systems problems, I think it's really, a, you know, hats off to our state government for pulling this off so well. Our local administrators are the ones in, um, who are going out and really attempting to enroll individuals. And in Northern Virginia, and more commonly now throughout the state, a lot of our human service programs have one-stop shopping. So if somebody comes in and qualifies for food stamps or qualifies for a TANF, uh, the caseworker also enrolls them in Medicaid expansion or asks them to go through the criteria check. So, and Medicaid expansion covers our working individuals. Right. They're making up to 138% of poverty. So it's incredibly important, you know, when people work 40 hours a week and they have families, they should be able to provide the necessities and health care is one of those. Well, you so. touched on something about the work. Most people who are qualified are already working. However, right. there was a compromise about 70% were right, already are, working. But there correct. was a co compromise, <clears throat> and, 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 and this, this uh, work requirement has been in the news recently, not in Virginia, but in Kentucky and Arkansas, where a, a court found that it was not legal, the work requirement was not legal. But actually, even though it was a compromise, it's, it's not actually, it's out there in the nebula. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, I, yes, that's a good way of putting it. We did have a work requirement with a fair number of exemptions uh, as part of the legislation we passed. Uh, however, we conditioned our legislation on the fact that Medicaid expansion would take place um, while we waited for the waiver requirement to come through. From and the federal government. From the federal government. And that waiver requirement was related to the work provision. That uh, requirement, that waiver hasn't been approved. And I can understand why there's a delay. I mean, the intent of the Affordable Care Act was to provide health coverage. That was the basic intent, and courts are looking at it from, you know, a constitutional issue about whether or not it's really constitutionally appropriate to require people this, to work if they're eligible. If they're for not, this. if they're not able to work, because remember this work requirement that the other states implemented, they were going to people who were not working, and for the most part, these individuals had a reason why they were not working. Um, some of them were disabled, some of them couldn't find jobs, some of them were doing community where there were reasons why. So can you deny, you know, health care coverage? Right, and, and there's a cost to administer um, this reasons. as well, right? Mm -hmm. So if, yeah. if you are busy tracking mm -hmm. all the people who are supposed to be in a job, job training program, actively looking for work, who are disabled temporarily, or, so the system to actually track whether people are eligible or not eligible kind of had a hefty price tag on it too, if I recall. $25 million, was that? That was roughly, <coughs> and of course, we, you know, yeah. our estimates are always based on estimates. We don't really know until our folks on the ground start implementing the, the provision. So there's always a cost with these monitoring provisions, and we have to reach a happy medium where we're ensuring program integrity and we're ensuring that public dollars are spent appropriately, but we're not overspending on monitoring to the point where we're setting up barriers and making it impossible for individuals to really qualify when in fact they are eligible. So at this stage of the game, we are enrolling people as of January 1. We, we are not under this uh, work requirement because it hasn't right. been approved by the federal government. It may not be if, if this mm -hmm. judge's um, uh, 
decision that it's not legal holds for all uh, Medicaid oh. expansion programs. So what is the association health care plans, these bills, about the insurance? So, so people, when they sign up for Medicaid expansion, they sign up for a plan, correct? Like they get a card and they choose from a plan. So what are these substitutions that um, are the, being the recommended? The association plans, take the realtors as an example, who want to have their own. Um, <clears throat> The problem with some of the association plans is <clears throat> they generally wind up skimming the cream and what that does is it increases the cost for other people. Uh, when you start segmenting the population, uh, somebody's going to have to pay for that. And what they're claiming is, you know, if our average agent is 52 years old, why should there be pregnancy benefits, things like that. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, that's part of the governor's amendment to okay. that plan that makes sense. is that they would have to provide, I think he added <coughs> three or four uh, uh, items that would have to be part of any of those plans, which of course the associations are opposed to. But um, you know, what happens is that uh, all of their members aren't 52 years old. And what happens is people buy into these plans without realizing um, that the benefits aren't there. And that's a big problem. And, it, you know, when you get to these other ones like catastrophic insurance, they cost a four, you know, they, right. they, they are cheaper, but they got deductibles that will knock your eyeballs out. And, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and so what you wind up is getting almost nothing. And, I mean, you can't afford the initial cost. They don't tell you that. Right. So, um, generally, I, I've had a problem with these, as have a lot of people. These I, are generally initiatives pushed by the Republican Party. They are. And, and I just want to jump in and to say that, you know, these uh, association plans or short-term plans, which mm -hmm. is another category of streamlined plans, they, they sound very appealing. <clears throat> Uh, Senator Saslaw is correct, folks who are mainly healthy and are not going to, to a doctor are the folks that buy these plans. So what happens is you end up with your standard insurance pool being depleted of healthy people. So the insurance rates are much higher for those of us who want reasonable <coughs> standard plans that cover most things. <coughs> and it becomes almost impossible or extremely expensive for individuals who have pre-existing conditions. Right. So when you're taking what Senator Saslaw said, the cream of the crop, I'll say the healthiest. When you're taking the healthiest individuals outside of the insurance pool, you're making it really costly for insurance companies to uh, cover those with pre-existing conditions. And it, it, from a, a public policy standpoint, these short-term plans and these association plans are not beneficial <coughs> to those who are the sickest in our communities and really need health insurance to manage chronic illnesses and other very serious conditions. Well, I want to just pivot for a minute talking about the burden on the, the people who can least afford it. I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the driver's license suspension. And I know that Senator Eben, you have worked on this bill, and it is another one that we hope is not dead for this legislative session because it impacts a huge number of Virginians who, whose licenses are suspended when they can't pay court fines. So it basically is punishing people who are already poor by removing the one thing that allows them to drive to work. That's right. There's <coughs> more than 600,000 Virginians who have lost their driver's licenses or have them suspended merely because they can't pay court costs often on a non-related offense, an offense that's not related to driving at all. And we also have additional Virginians who don't have licenses based on offenses that have nothing to do with driving. This impacts your ability to get to work, of course. Uh, there's been studies that show people have had this happen to them. Some of them lose their jobs. Generally, uh, a lot of them have lower paying jobs, as we found out in other states from studies. And it's just wrong. It's unrelated. Now, the governor, the bill failed during our regular session, but the governor made a wise amendment to the budget, which we'll be considering on April 3rd. And that amendment says that uh, it basically takes the bill, puts it back into the budget. As he had originally, he covered the cost of that mm -hmm. to the state budget, mm -hmm. but this goes in there again. So finally, we'll have in both bodies 
on the floor an up or down vote on whether or not to accept it. And people need to drive. <coughs> if well, if it to doesn't work. pass. Further, the House, I want to mention. We won't see it. I, I want to mention one other um, bill. Uh, we also have had a bill to let immigrants have driving uh, right. licenses right. Uh, right. because a lot of immigrants yep. who are not documented can't drive, and yet they're working and they're yep. driving on Virginia roads. We need them to be able to take a road test, show that they know the rules of the road, and make it safer for everyone. And that's another driving issue that we've had here in Virginia. And I just want to say I sit on the Transportation Committee and heard the, the bill that uh, Senator Evans referring to. And the Department um, of um, Motor Vehicles was actually in favor of having this driver's license for the safety reasons. But um, the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles made it very clear that we could differentiate on the license and specifically say this uh, could not be used for federal identification purposes. So we didn't have to get into that element of the license conversation. We could just issue a <coughs> license purely for driving purposes so we could acknowledge that the person passed the driver's test, understands the rules of the road. So it was, uh, there, there are clearly ways we can do this. So what, have been, what, has, what was the pushback here? You know, first of all, obviously these fines and fees um, are revenue, sure. right? So you have, there's a fiscal impact and so you have to replace this revenue. Like what are we going to do if we don't have these fines and fees? So the budget amendment does that. It says we found money to cover the loss of fines and fees for, for this particular bill. But what were the objections, for instance, well, for, the, for the one for the immigrants? Yeah. Well, one of the uh, underlying objections is the fact that they are immigrants. And we've had an anti-immigrant uh, sentiment in the General Assembly for years. And people don't want to uh, give immigrants really anything. In fact, they want to categorize uh, areas in Virginia as what they would call sanctuary cities. Oh. We don't have any such places in Virginia. But there's a real effort on the uh, other side of the aisle to portray uh, yeah. folks as lawbreakers uh, when they are already here, and uh, we can't we and can't give into that. Uh, I think you'll see a change next year if the elections tip the other way. Uh, we've seen it also with letting kids get college tuition who have grown up in Virginia, yeah. going to Virginia schools, who are paying Virginia taxes, whose parents pay Virginia taxes, and yet there's resistance to giving them in-state tuition. Yeah, and, and let's just pause for a minute to explain that how our system works is even though the Republicans hold a one-seat majority in both the House and the Senate, because of that majority, they dictate who sits on committees. Mm -hmm. And so every committee has a majority of Republicans. So unless, That's correct. That's so right. if, unless a Republican votes with the minority for some of these bills, it never sees the light of day. It can't get out for a floor vote. Right. That's right. And, right. and one would think that with the uh, House and the Senate so closely divided, the committees would also be pretty close to each other. The Republicans would have maybe a one vote majority, but it doesn't work that way. The important committees in the Senate are dominated by Republicans. For example, the money committee, the main money committee, finance. Um, Education and health, where uh, a lot of these bills would come well, through that, that. But let me just give the number. That's where <laughs> I was heading. <laughs> it was not the committee. And health um, eight, seven. It, it's in and finance it's 11 to republicans five. to five democrats wow so in fact we're two of the five and commerce and labor it's 11 to four, four. 11 to four yeah. right and which rules. makes it so, almost and, impossible and, and rules it's uh 11 to four nine to four nine to four, nine to four. <laughs> we're on that too <laughs> so it's not proportional but then there are no rules about it having to be proportional it actually the rules of the senate say to the extent practicable they should be it says practicable but but that's, that's the Senate work. That <laughs> but the majority, I mean, but the, the, the majority passed the, the rules. Yeah. The majority yeah. is what Votes. the rules, yeah. 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 The, re the rules are what the majority right. says they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if we get in the majority, the rules will be what we say they are. Right. And yeah. we certainly will treat them as well as they've treated us. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, fair is fair. We're going to be fair. It, it is very <laughs> discouraging, though, and I think very unhealthy to have this yeah. this uh, um, theme in the General Assembly where you know it's okay to treat immigrants as an underclass mm -hmm. I think that is very it's very dangerous um, individuals need to be integrated into our society fully so they can go to college and 
get a good job, et cetera, et cetera. If not, I think you're really sowing the seeds for, uh, you know, criminal behavior and other kinds of very negative societal impacts. So it's it's very troubling. And immigrants are part of our economy, which I think they sometimes are. Yeah. strong part. There's and never been an taxes. immigrant group that has come to this country that hasn't made us a better, stronger country for Absolutely. There's never been a one. Even though initially no Irish need apply, mm -hmm. the Italians, you know, every group too that has come has been That's at correct. the lowest at the lowest right. rung and people right. were like, We don't want you here. We need to be more enlightened now and we've seen that there are plenty of jobs that go unfilled, jobs uh, at the higher end that need to be trained, as well as jobs at the lower end that need to be uh, filled in order for people to uh, go about their lives. If you want to um, have your uh, dinner and have some strawberries for dessert, if you want to have a busboy, if you want your uh, house cleaned, you're talking about immigrants in large measure. If you want to win a Nobel Prize, we've had a majority of our Nobel Prize winners be immigrants, immigrants. in this country as That's well. True. So clearly they make us stronger. They let, they let Virginia and the country uh, function. Well, so I believe, turning back to the, the particular driver's license issue, um, Secretary of Public Safety and Homeland Security, Brian, Brian Moran, Moran, also Brian. came out kind of in favor of making sure that people have licenses and that the suspensions don't add to people then being pulled over with a suspended license and now there's more fines, there's right. more fees, there are more court dates. It, it basically is crippling a large segment of our workforce, particularly in rural Virginia where there is, uh, public transportation is just not That's an right. alternative. It's a cycle. Yeah. It's a cycle and the administration has been very smart in the measures they've endorsed, proposed, and fought for. And so do you think that this has a chance? I mean, again, we, this is being taped before April 3rd. And if it doesn't have a chance this year, what is the strategy for next year? And is that really dependent on November? Well, the, you know, the removing um, the financial panel, removing the licensing, if an individual cannot afford to pay the fines, has had some bipartisan support. I don't know if the bill it, it will, did in the will Senate, make for it sure. through the House. Yes, it has. Bi it had bipartisan support in the Senate. So I'm really hopeful. I mean, you know, if um, if the Republicans are going to talk about how important it is to encourage work, then how can you justify removing a license from somebody who needs to get to work to pay their fine? I, I don't see the logic there. And there are two, two factors that will determine if it has a chance. One is if the Republicans in the House of Delegates vote as a block, which they may well do. And then the other piece is the Speaker of the House has to allow that amendment to be ruled in order. In order. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't realize how powerful the Speaker of the House is. Um, Republicans control that body uh, basically because a tie election resulted in a coin flip that they won. And you wouldn't think that it was a cooperative equal attitude as Senator Howell had said, it's uh, to the victors go the spoils, uh, certainly in the House of Delegates. Yeah. And so, so, so the people at home understand, so you are in the Senate and there's 40 people in the Senate, but there's 100 people in the House. And generally, there's a lot of things that get passed in the Senate, mm -hmm. but they die equal in the House. Amendment. And so, good so explain a little bit about how you can do good work where you are and it, it will still be killed. But I think um, something that is really different between the House and the Senate is in the Senate um, there is a willingness to work across party lines and regional lines, but especially party lines. Uh, the House is much more partisan, and there are good reasons for that. I'm sure you know they can outline why they feel so strongly that way, and one of the issues that was just mentioned was the ERA, was what drove that division in the House. Uh, but in the Senate, we can get things passed uh, on a bipartisan basis, but unfortunately, they then have to go to, this, to the House and be approved. And it, you'll see a lot more division on the uh, votes on the floor, where you'll see some Republicans do one thing, some another. In some cases, the Democrats as well. Uh, we saw in the uh, Senate a number of equality bills, uh, LGBTQ yes. equality that passed with more than 30 votes. Almost a majority of Republicans, or in one case, a majority of Republicans supported it. Then it goes to the House of Delegates, and you see parliamentary shenanigans happen, where the Speaker first assigns the bill to the wrong committee, then it gets assigned to the right committee, but it doesn't make it on the agenda, then they fight over whether or not to adjourn. 
in the Senate, we tend to just take a vote on a bill, hear the, hear the merits, and take a vote. In the House, if they're afraid they're going to lose the vote or it won't make them look good, we've had times where they just don't take the vote. And some analysts believe that perhaps uh, the partisanship that we've just been talking about could be minimized a bit when we have an independent commission drawing the redistricting lines. Right, and we're uh, closer than right, ever to that. Yes, to right that. now yeah. folks really worry about primaries because the jurisdictions are drawn heavily weighed towards one party or the other. So one of the um, very important issues that we did pass this year was uh, language to amend our Constitution that would set up an independent commission to redraw our districts. Now that language has to pass a second time, exactly right. the same way, the same wording uh, with an election in because, between. Because you're talking about amending the Constitution, correct? Yeah, and the there's a whole Constitution. Pr process to that. That's right. So has you just to pass the General Assembly twice, twice, twice. With, an election with, in a, with an election of the House of Delegates in between. Right, so we are theoretically very close to having a commission. The, the, there is one other possible uh, snag. Yeah. Um, the Arizona case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, yeah. and it was a five to four decision with Kennedy breaking the tie. Kennedy's not there now, Kavanaugh is. The dissent, and it was a very strong dissent written by Justice Roberts, said the Constitution is very clear that Senate and, uh, and the House have be redistricted by the legislatures thereof. He quoted the Constitution. Uh, but, but it, should that language, go back? Well, we our, our language, language sends it back for a, sends it back for an up or down to vote. To an up or down vote in the General Assembly. So, yeah. So that so that's may how we that may provide that unless it. they were to rule that citizens period cannot participate, mm -hmm. and that I, I have a feeling there will ultimately be a court test. Of yeah, that, we'll I just have so, to I wait so, and too. see. You know, but we're trying to make progress. No, and, and I can appreciate that too because I think also a lot of people don't understand that that um, the separation of powers and the separation of government means that state governments can do mm -hmm. decide things on their mm -hmm. own as long as it's not prohibited by the federal government. So, right. so the right. Supreme Court interpreting that something is not constitutional at the federal level would mean that we can't necessarily do our own thing in the state <coughs> if it's if it's prohibited or they interpret the Constitution right. which is prohibited. which is why we were very careful in crafting the language that we ultimately that passed is um, you know we have this independent Commission drawing the lines but they refer it back to the General Assembly and it is an up or down vote so at the end of the day the General Assembly is Approving. approving it. Okay. Is taking the action. Um, I've been in the General Assembly in the Senate now for 28 years, and the lobbying, the citizen lobbying that we saw on the the gerrymandering issue was is the something, most something I want to talk about when we come okay. back from this break. So okay. please okay. join us after this break when we are talking with members of our Senate. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. No. <laughs> Operation Wonder Park is a go! There's nothing more powerful than imagination. Honey, have you seen my cell phone? But don't just imagine. My park came to life? Ooh, a plot twist! Use STEM to build. Ta -da! Ta -da! Create. She did it! And change the world. Who's with me? I'm more of a two feet on the ground kind of guy. hurt tomorrow. If she can STEM, so can you. Find out more at She Can STEM. This is what high blood pressure looks like. Talk with your doctor to create a treatment plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. 
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today is a special edition of Inside Scoop done in collaboration with SALT, Social Action Linking Together, an advocacy organization that has been advocating for good public policy since 1983, focused on human services in the most marginalized of communities here in Virginia. Joining me on this panel today are Adam Eben, Senator Adam Eben of District 30, Senator Barbara Favola of District 31, Senator Dick Saslaw from District 35, and Senator Janet Howe from District 32. When we went to break, Janet, you were about to make some observations based on the length of time that you have been in the Senate about the Senate. <coughs> yeah, well, what the observation I was going to make was how impressive it was the one Virginia 2021 uh, lobbying on behalf of ger getting gerrymandering out of our state. Um, they've been at it about five years now. They've made many proposals, but this last year they have been focused on this one issue and trying to get something passed and on the Constitution, <coughs> um, on the ballot in, in a year dealing with this. And I, you know, typically if I get four or five emails on a topic, I say, this is important, I better pay a whole lot of attention to this. I got over a thousand postcards, a thousand postcards on this one issue. Well, you've spoken to something very important, and that is organizing citizens, organizing mm -hmm. voters, and organizing your constituents. That's yep. very important in this process. Yes, and it actually, I want to little hats off to SALT, because that's what <coughs> SALT's been doing all these years, too, speaking on issues that most, um, most other people don't. They're speaking for other people on behalf of yeah. other people rather than on their own behalf. <coughs> uh, and it's unusual, and it's very powerful. I think it is because there are lobbyists who represent different organizations, Business, business big, interests, businesses, or associ mm -hmm. big or associations, and they're paid lobbyists, oh, and they yeah. register as paid lobbyists. But for issues having to do with people who live in poverty or who have a lot of issues related to being in poverty, there are no lobbyists. Basically, mm -hmm. it is organizations like SALT mm -hmm. who organize your constituents, people who come to the State House people who, who write your postcards and they send you emails and they call you on the telephone. Mm -hmm. And they also organize people to show up and testify mm -hmm. in yes. the committees, which is very powerful. Very powerful. It really is. A lot of legislators just, well, I think all legislators <coughs> pay attention to situations that actually occur. It's one thing to cite some numbers. It's another thing for someone to come to the committee and say, this happened to me and this is how it worked and we need you to change it. And I think with SALT, because I did an interview with um, Kimberly Jenkins Snodgrass, I think I got her name right, and her son is in Red Onion, and he has been in solitary confinement. And so SALT has taken up this issue in collaboration with other organizations who are also working on this issue under the broader umbrella of criminal justice reform. Yeah. And I think everybody acknowledges we have to do something. We have a problem with mass incarceration. It uh, disproportionately affects minorities, um, black yes. men. And so the solitary confinement issue has gotten some traction, and I know that you have some thoughts about that and what SALT is actually asking for. Well, to SALT's credit, um, SALT has been very uh, proactive in trying to make our justice system um, more rehabilitative, acknowledging that 90% of our jailed inmates will be released into the communities. So SALT has always taken the approach, we have to empower these individuals to be able to fit into the communities. And one really important element there is eliminating uh, solitary confinement because solitary confinement has an incredibly um, negative effect on an individual's mental or emotional health. I mean, just think about it. You right. know, we are in solitary confinement. You're removed from, uh, the socialization process. You're isolated. You're by yourself. And, uh, and it's a very damaging and it's not constructive. It's not helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't add to the mission of, at some point, being able to rehabilitate an individual so he can uh, re-enter society. Um, so I put in a bill, but there were many co-patrons. I know my bill, with, I believe, was merged into Senator Saslaw's bill. We had Senator Saslaw put in and a bill Patrick as Delegate well. Hopes. And then Delegate Hope had, had a bill. 
um, and we were all trying to get to the data. You know, when do you use solitary confinement? Why do you use it? If you could break out the profile of the prisoner who was most likely to be subjected to solitary confinement, so we can better understand what's going on and, uh, and have a conversation and a constructive conversation on how to uh, address the issue and come up with alternatives. I mean, we understand the Justice Department has told us, look, some people have to be isolated for personal security reasons, or some people have moments of outbursts and they're violent and they have to be isolated because there's a fear of um, harm, harming another prisoner. And we acknowledge that. But there are other best practices out there that are not relying on solitary confinement. And we're trying to take the first step to figure out what the lay of the land is and how we can come up with strategies going forward. And I think one of the things SALT is asking for specifically is to identify vulnerable, vulnerable communities of people who should not be put in solitary confinement except as a measure of last resort. And those are people under 21. Juveniles, absolutely. People over 55. Right. Mm -hmm. um, people in the LGBTI community. Women who are pregnant. Women who are postpartum. Those issues, and there's been other legislation and a lot of things going on around about how we treat those who are incarcerated, including mental health. And, and this is one of the problems, I think, too, with solitary confinement, is often people who already have mental health issues are then separated from the general population and put in solitary confinement, where it only makes the situation worse. Right. We, I mean, we, um, right now, Secretary Moran has told the General Assembly that mental health assessments are conducted on prisoners. But what is not uh, conducted or not available would be a full mental health treatment plan for those individuals. Um, it was just a few years ago, I guess five years ago, um, that I managed to get the General Assembly with the help of my friends over here, Senator Saslaw <laughs> and, and, and Senator Howell on the Finance Committee, to approve funding for every single juvenile who is before sentencing, who is given a mental <laughs> health evaluation and a treatment plan. But we had to put money in the budget to do that. We haven't gotten to the point of doing that in our adult prisons, but that, you know, our jails are the largest conduit of individuals with mental health problems, and we know that. Right. Barbara mentioned the juveniles, and something that's been going on in Virginia, which is really good news, is the total reformation of our juvenile justice system. Yeah. Yes. Over the last five years, yeah. we have gone from a medieval, yeah. in my opinion, system of basically just incarcerating kids in large facilities uh, with minimal programs and really harsh surroundings. Uh, and we now have about <coughs> one-third as many kids in any kind of facility, and the facilities that we're building are small and <coughs> in their communities. Community-based programs, which Community is, based. what they're we've diversion, been trying to move. Yeah, they're diversion uh, programs. Um, and part of this is we were able to adequately fund the Children's Services Act so we can provide behavioral interventions early. Um, because we can identify these kids at a very early age and experts, you know, mental health counselors, teachers, nurses, uh, even f individuals in the faith community can point out the kids who really need assistance right away and need some help and we can divert them from ever getting into the juvenile justice system. But again, we had to fund the children's services, uh, the CSA program. Mm -hmm. And part of this, Rather too, robustly. is all tied up into education funding as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we probably have more SROs in any given school than we have counselors. And so and we've got 134 school districts in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and some of them are in different places. Fairfax County is not where right. Roanoke County is. And mm -hmm. so we have to look at the fact that allocating resources for mental health supports for children is also tied up into who gets shunted through the school to prison pipeline to, to the juvenile justice system. It, it certainly is, and school resource officers, which we're referring to, uh, we did increase the ratio mm -hmm. of school resource officers to students, or I'm sorry, I should say counselors when you talk counselors. about mental health, yeah. counselors to students, but not by the uh, same uh, ratio that the governor had proposed in his original budget. And we've got to do more there. Yeah. But just to take a walk back to uh, prison reform and solitary confinement, eight years ago I went with uh, Delegate Hope and we toured three of uh, Virginia's 
prisons, including a supermax and one that is uh, designed for mental health uh, treatment. And when I was told by one of the uh, prison officials, I said, how often do they get mental health uh, care and uh, talk therapy particularly? I was told every day, and I said, really, every day? And they said, yes, someone goes by the cell every day and says, how are you doing? That's not That's not therapy. therapy. Some of them get therapy, or a, a certain number do, but solitary confinement is not just something that we think is a bad practice, it's something that the UN has labeled as torture. And you refer to people um, going in there who have mental illness having exacerbated by being in solitary. It's not just those who already have mental illness, although those are the most vulnerable, but it's people who aren't even mentally ill to who become with. mentally ill. Yeah. Think about it, 365 days a year, you're let out to take a shower once or twice a week, and you're allowed to exercise in a cage outside where you are um, a few times a week. That's not the kind of treatment for anyone who's going to be integrated into the community. Senator Favola mentioned that a lot of our prisoners are reentering the community eventually. That includes people in solitary confinement. Could you imagine being separated, no socialization, no anger management opportunities, no um, addiction treatment, and then one day you're just allowed into the community? That's not what we want, and thankfully we're uh, starting to work out of that with uh, classes in those particular areas. So Director mm -hmm. Clark has done a good job in that regard, but you mentioned Salt and Ms. Snodgrass, who Salt had right. put me in touch with a few years ago. She's not the only parent who has that situation, mm -hmm. or the only individual with parents who has that situation. We've got to do a better job about trying to get it to zero. Right. And you know, in your district, Senator Eben, you have Friends of Guest House, which is a reentry program for women who've been for, in, formerly incarcerated. And it's one of the few programs in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia, and they serve 29 women at a time, which is very small because exponentially the rate of incarceration for women is up by like 300 percent in the last 20 years. And our facilities haven't really been designed, our jails haven't really been designed. There are, there are jails in Virginia that were never meant to house women, mm -hmm. but they do now. Yes, and Friends of Guest House is, has got a, a huge waiting list, and that speaks to the demand. They are opening another facility in the west end of Alexandria, which will increase their space somewhat, but it's, it's a, a big need. It's a big need. And women in prison, as well as men in prison, need to be treated for rehabilitation. Women, as one of my panelists was reminding me, are more rehabilitatable in that <laughs> they... Um, data's data. But, but when you get out of prison, women and men need a place to go, they need hopefully family supports, and they need an opportunity to earn income. And those just don't come out by magic when you're released one day. They can afford them. That is true. And, and I think part of the... Um, the, the rise in women being incar incarcerated are addiction related and trauma related. Yeah, and trauma. Like trauma. not ninety percent of women who are incarcerated have been traumatized right. physically or sexually yeah, that's, abused. That's correct. And so that leads in, in trauma a lot of experts will argue is the path to addiction too. Mm -hmm. yes. the addiction is born yeah, out of trauma. It, yes. Yeah. And so we've got this population there. of women and the the answer isn't putting more beds in more jails and prisons, it's trying to figure out the resources necessary. In Virginia Correct me if I'm well, wrong. It's kind of conservative. Well, you know, we've made progress. <laughs> we're 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 funding um, because of the work of the Deeds Commission, which has really done yeoman's work. And I, I think some of my colleagues sit on the the Deeds Commission. Senator Howell does. Uh, and the commission came up with a strategy for one day, same day service yes. for mental health access from the CSB boards. Right, which is a phenomenal. If we can truly fund it statewide, that will be a phenomenal change in the way we've approached mental health. Because uh, so often mental health uh, issues have been pushed under the table, there's been a stigma associated with it, coupled with the fact that insurance plans have not adequately covered mental health services and there are not a lot of community programs where individuals can go to get treatment. So when you look at the whole labyrinth, we've had lots of challenges to overcome, but to make a commitment for same-day access when an individual knows she, he or she's feeling depressed or there's an issue or they're suffering trauma is a, a big, big step forward. I well, think it is too because <coughs> the community services board are in each individual community. I think you hit something when it has to be fully funded. There has to be resources to provide what the public Which policy Medicaid is Medicaid expansion is going to help with. 77,000 individuals out of the potential 
uh, pool will be able to access mental health services. They need them now, and they're not getting them because they're not on Medicaid. <coughs> and the, the consequence of that is often they're incarcerated. Right. What, we what? don't have we don't have services in the community, and someone's acting up. It is highly probable that they will be arrested and mm -hmm. put into then our criminal justice system, <laughs> where I think we've already agreed they really don't belong. Uh, they need well, the services. So well, that's another big effort that we're making. Um, one thing I've been particularly involved with is permanent supportive housing for people with mental, mental illness. And that, although it seems costly, is actually a huge savings for our budget because people are incarcerated less, less and they're in the um, emergency room and hospitalized less. Uh, so it, I think what we keep coming back to is doing the humane and kind thing is often the best thing economically, economically as well. And, and, one, of the, one of the problems that we've never been able to come to grips with, not just in Virginia but in this country in general, you put people in prison or jails because they're dangerous to other people. About 30 percent of the people that we have in, in our prison system are there because we were angry with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that's the bottom line. We we were angry with them, and uh, you know, uh, they were uh, a problem in the community. They were this and that, and we're going to punish them by putting them in jail. You don't put these people in jail. And if, in fact, the numbers that I've gotten is anywhere, uh, well, it's 25 to 30 percent are nonviolent people who we have in our Department of Corrections. And we need to find another place, uh, you know, to put these people, where we can probably work with them. If you're da if you're dangerous to the public, you know, and you, you, you know, and you've been convicted of that, you belong in prison. But if you're not, we need to find some place else because we're paying thirty-two thousand dollars a year to house th these folks, and and as has been pointed out by. Senators from Bowen and Howe, we're not do, and, and Senator, Senator Evan, we're not doing anything to help these people. And we've got to get past this mentality of locking up people who we're angry with as opposed to, you know, people who should be there. Like I said, you put people in, in prison because they're dangerous, not because you're mad at them. And there's and, a lot of overlap here with the opioid crisis, too, <laughs> because we are now locking up people, which in some cases has <laughs> saved their lives. Mm -hmm. from overdose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then they are put right back on the street with no supports, no options, and now a felon. They can't <coughs> get housing, can't get a job, don't have a driver's license or whatever, and what do we expect from them? They end up right back on the same cycle same of addiction and incarceration. And I'm not sure what there, the answer is. We, we have done some strategies. Uh, um, individuals can get naloxone without uh, prescription. Um, and we're doing a lot of training. Our uh, police departments and our emergency protect our emergency workers uh, know how to administer drugs to uh, assist somebody who might be going into a, a coma or having a, a very negative medical effect from an overdose. Um, but it, it's you know it's a challenge. A couple years ago, we did create a, a database for prescriptions, so providers have to report in when they. Um, issue a prescription that has an opioid element to it. So there's at least some central database where doctors can look and figure out just exactly what kind of prescription medication has been given to a, a certain patient. But it's, it's really a challenge. I know, I know that it is. One of the things that I think the medical community has really stepped up about is they have a much greater understanding now about their role in the op opioid abuse. <coughs> um, one of the most powerful panels I ever saw was about four years ago with various parents talking about their deceased teenagers. And in every case, the child had started on opioids because of a sports injury. Mm. Yes. Mm. And but think about wisdom teeth. <laughs> 30 days, 30 days of Oxycontin for pulled oh, wisdom teeth. Yeah. And it sits in the, in the medicine cabinet, and these kids are taking them to pill parties and passing them around. I mean, I mean at this point, I think enough uh, investigative journalism has been done. Dope Sick by Beth sure. Macy really talks about how these opioids got into the hands of young people. 
Um, and now that we have awareness, it's, it's, it's going to be a constant battle. And one of the things that she is advocating for is that, um, you know, treating addiction needs to be part of primary health care. We've just Absolutely. gotten to the Absolutely. point yeah. where Absolutely. primary health providers have to recognize addiction, have a plan. To your well, point, there has well, to be therapy and support. Well, there's too. a relationship to mental health issues. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, I mean, a lot of folks are, are continuing with their drugs because there's a, a mental health issue there. Yes. So, to the degree where we can link mental health with primary care, which we are incentivizing, uh, we can get at least to part of the problem. So the last thing before we, we, we finish up the segment, I do want to talk about the Foster Care Caucus oh. because I work with foster care here in Fairfax That's County true. and I was delighted to read about the caucus, but the members of the caucus, who's in the caucus and about kinship care. So mm -hmm. who wants to start there? Senator Well, Howe? why don't I, well, I'll start. Um, we had this December a report, an absolutely devastating report by the Joint Audit, Legislative Audit and Review Commission major commission uh, in Virginia, pointing out the flaws in our foster care system. And they were flaws we basically knew about, but this confirmed <coughs> it. Yeah. And a number of people got very engaged in the process. Uh, I was immediately involved with um, Bryce Reeves, Senator Reeves, who's head of the Rehab Committee, he and I agreed that I would get the funding to implement everything and he would get the law passed. Uh, and we were quite successful in both of us in getting that accomplished. But we had this unexpected assistance. The Foster Care Caucus was formed and it was both senators and delegates with a intense interest in foster care. Many of them had been foster children themselves. Some had been oh, foster God, parents. Yeah. So there was this just universal push. Yeah. Now, something though that was unexpected and just one of those complications that you sometimes get, Senator Reeves and I put budget amendments and bills in on the House side, nobody did on I mean, on the and Senate side, it. nobody did on the House side. So when the budget came out, there was no money in the House budget for any of this. So that made yeah. Senator Sassler and I, as, um, as conferees, had a very difficult job because typically, if the House doesn't fund something, they're not gonna wanna do it in, in conference either. But I think because of this huge interest and the caucuses, um, interest across and the both parties, both parties, both houses. I think we made it a big step forward. And there is also, what I'm excited about the caucus is there is also a commitment to make sure we follow through. Accountability, because yes. it's great to pass laws, but then somebody has to follow up to make sure that they're being executed appropriately. Yep. So with kinship care, it's kind of a startling statistic that in Virginia, only 6% of children in foster care are placed with a relative and the national average is 32 percent. Right. Um, well, we just implemented a kinship care law and it was three years ago and, it, and I had been working on it my entire time I was in the Senate. So it's been a struggle. But there's a kinship care uh, act at the federal level which um, allows states to draw down federal money if they meet certain requirements. And first off, a kin or relative has to already be in the foster care system. So it's not a diversion. And then a relative can step up and go through the training, agree to act as a foster parent for six months, sort of a trial and error, and then go before a JDR judge and um, negotiate a permanency agreement. So in the meanwhile, the, uh, the parent, the kinship parents, can draw down some Title IV money um, so they can have the resources to take <coughs> care of the children. One of the reasons Virginia has, has such a low number is we just started participating in drawing down the federal money. There are many relatives who want to take care of their kin, but it, it's costly today to raise a child. It and is. you think about sending them to college, and you think about the young, young child who wants to drive a car, and you know, the insurance and all that. So there are a lot of expenses, and relatives um, really need the financial assistance. So we've only had it implemented three years, and we're going through a training. We're still training a lot of our caseworkers 
around the state, but I'm hoping the number gets higher. I am too, and of course there's there's local foster care. Fairfax County has its own foster care system, and as a county we have a lot of assets and resources, and so our systems tend to be a little bit ahead of the rest of the Commonwealth mm -hmm. of Virginia. In more rural areas, I would imagine it's much harder to get the word out to families that they are eligible for financial support if they take a niece, a nephew, or a grandchild. Yeah, we need to get the word out because uh, the chances are there are probably more relatives around in the in the rural parts of the state. Um, the families tend to be a little bit more cohesive and uh, have a little bit less dispersion in some of the rural pockets of the state. So our uh, evidence suggests, which is interesting. Well, and the other thing too is that a lot of uh, those who are incarcerated often have been in the foster care system as well. So there's all these multi-layered things that are, you know. At the end of the day, we need to strive for permanency. A child survives best when a child knows this is my home and will always be my home. So to the degree we can give that child permanency, and frequently a relative can do that, we're providing the huge gift to that child. And, the, and again, the child can continue on and go to college and always have that permanent home. So I just want to say, as we wrap up this segment, that this is 2019, which is an election year. It's an off, off, off election year. We have no top of the ticket, no congressman, no senator, no governor. We're the top of the ticket. We're, we're the top. You're looking at the top. We're the top. top. What are you Wait talking for about? You to say that we're the top of the. We're the top of the ticket. We're the top of the ticket. And, the ticket. and we always are. And, and we need people to pay attention to the fact that the things we've been talking about here today only happen when you have elected people whose values align with your own values. Mm -hmm. And so people really need to get involved and get out and vote, even though it, you know we've got Board of Supervisors, we've got School Board, we've got House of Delegates, and the Constitutional Senate. Constitutional officers as well. That's right, we've got sheriffs and um, Commonwealth uh, Commonwealth's attorneys. attorneys. And so people really need to pay attention because mm -hmm. good laws and good public policy are passed by people who've made these um, a priority. And budgets, mm -hmm. and Correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Saslaw, but budgets are nothing more than a statement about what our priorities are and what we care about. That's pretty much on target. Okay. So I want to thank each of you, Senator Eben, Senator you. Favola, thank you. Senator Saslaw, and Senator Howe for being here today. All okay. of them are up for re-election. Yeah. I want you to remember, too, that SALT, Social Action Linking Together, is our collaborating partner for this special edition, and you can find information about their legislative agenda on their website. SALT not only works during the legislative session, and I'll remind you we have a part-time legislature here in Virginia, but SALT works year-round to do a work advocating for those who are most marginal marginalized in our community not just at the state level, but also at the local level. And if you want to get involved in being at the very base of good public policy, please reach out to SALT, reach out to John Horsch, and ask what you can do to be part of this democracy.